Well, welcome everyone to this Magic and Ecology live panel on environmental magic and geomancy. I'm Simone Kotva, one of the co-conveners of Magic and Ecology, the series of online conversations and seminars that brings together scholars thinking about magic in relation to ecology and practitioners working with magic to transform modes of earth living. And tonight it is a delight and a pleasure to welcome our two speakers, Josephine McCarthy and Alexander Cummins. So I'll just say a few brief words about them both. Josephine McCarthy is an esoteric practitioner, teacher and author of 26 books on the theory and practice of Western magic and four fiction works on similar themes. Her work has particular emphasis on the magician's relationship with the land and environment and the magical analysis of New Kingdom Egyptian funerary texts, an exploration of the living use of such texts with the concept of the deities as forces of nature. She's also the author of Horia, an extensive in-depth open source training course in the theory, practice and history of Western magic that moves magical practice into deeper cooperative relationships with nature. Josephine, a warm welcome to the panel. Thank you. And thank you for asking me. It's a pleasure to be here. The delight is ours. Alexander Cummins is an historian, poet and consultant sorcerer whose practice centres around religion, philosophy, medicine and magic. He's the author of The Starry Rubric, 17th century English astrology and magic, which explores the history of magical approaches to the emotions from mapping personality with astrology, to managing emotionality with herbs and amulets, to the manipulations of aphrodisiacs, the evil eye, and the conjuration of spirits. He also has a special interest in geomancy and the history and practice of seeking conversation with non-human spirit entities through the aid of interpreting the non-human environment. Cummins writes for both academic and esoteric publishers and facilitates a range of workshops and lecture series. Alexander, welcome to the panel. Hi, yeah, thanks for having me. It's, it's great to be here. I'm excited to, to talk about this. Thank you so much. It's really exciting. Um, and I look forward to this conversation. And I thought what we could do is begin by giving you each a chance to say a few words about the talks that went up last week. And then we'll open up the conversation and take it from there. I have an opening question. I have many questions, but I'll keep it to one. And so everybody in uh, the Zoom room, if you want to get your thoughts out, you can drop questions in the chat and I'll start fielding those when we get into the discussion. So yeah, Josephine, would you like to go first and say a few words about your talk? Sure. Um, what I did to cover in my talk was the magician's relationship with beings within nature, with consciousness within nature, and, and how important that is to build an emotive relationship with the consciousness of the land because if you have an emotional connection then you start to protect and um, be more aware of, of how your actions can affect the land that's the very short version thank you so much that's brilliant alexander i talked about a european renaissance divination system uh, referred to as geomancy um, originally, I was going to spend a lot more time separating out the particular form, it was computational, very much based on the use and rules of astrology without actually being, ba being based in source to ledge or fall or the generation of quote random numbers, uh, and discussed how that particular divination system helps map, manage and potentially manipulate um, the humours, and not just the humours of the body, but the occult virtues, properties, proclivities, um, dynamisms in situations and crucially places and kind of exploring for instance the planetary landscape uh, in, a, in a way that allows us to get at coherences of occult or, um, or specifically planetary virtue uh, instantiated in locations um, rather than simply relying on uh, the time to be right and so exploring how geomancy uses the grammar of the stars uh, to talk about here and now uh, and does so and doesn't have to rely on particular times for elections and things and what that means in terms of a, a magic of space rather than magic of time if indeed as Proclus says uh, time is the movement of the celestial bodies. 
Thank you. So there are some really interesting, if I can start with my, uh, my opening question to both of you. Um, what I was struck with in your talks is the emphasis on, as, as Josephine was saying, is cultivating an emotional connection to the environment. And what Alexander, you talk about in your paper, the uh, way of interfacing with the earth. And it strikes me that this is the description of a technique I'm interested in talking about magic, not just as a worldview or an opinion about how the world works, as a kind of pragmatics. And might, one might call it attentiveness or attunement or a sort of resonance, perhaps, a building up of a resonance that was very striking in how Josephine, you were describing the practice and the sort of cultivation, the building up of this emotional connection. And this seems to become more important. What I mean is the technical aspect, as it were, or the pragmatic seem to come to the fore when we consider magic from an ecological perspective. So this idea of becoming vague, I think that's how Josephine described it, becoming uh, the ability to be surprised by what may be there, something you cannot predict. And this came out also interestingly in, in Alexander's presentation, because we're talking about the sort of tension between prediction and spontaneity, how you establish a pattern. And the pattern is familiar and, and it's set to a certain extent, but the way in which the elements of the pattern can be constellated can't be determined. And it's sort of infinite, right? It's endless. So it's, it's, a, it's a practice of being attentive to something that may look familiar at first, something you're very used to. So you will walk down the street talking about the sort of Josephine's um, uh, you know, familiar environments, and yet teaching yourself to be attentive to that and to be able to be surprised by it. So, so yeah, I'd love to hear more about what you both think about the, the pragmatics here and this idea of attention that seems to be moving beneath the surface. The thing is, is in, in modern life, in modern Western life, everything is very organized and controlled and timed and, and we're used to that on a day-to-day -day basis and we're also used to proving things and that things have to be solid and dependable and that is the killer for for magic and for magical interaction and paying attention is the first and the earliest key to building that sort of relationship because it's the tiniest little things and and as i was saying in my talk it, it doesn't matter if it comes from your subconscious. It's it's the opening of that relationship that, that then starts to open the door for, for conversations with things that are not you. Um, and so being able to be very flexible in how you respond to your environment around you on a day-to-day -day basis, on an everyday ordinary, not, you know, walking down the street and expecting... I don't know, the queen of the fairies to pop out the pavement and, and give you great wisdom, but you know, walking down the street and suddenly you notice that there's a particular rook that's popping alongside and you, you oh, hello, and you talk to the rook and then something drops into your head. You know, maybe could you, could you turn this way? Could you do that? And instead of rationalizing it, you go with it. And that starts to open up the imagination. It starts to slough off this, this mentality of everything has to be sane and rigid at all times. And that fluidity, along with paying attention, that's what starts to open the door for relationships with everything around you, everything that's alive. Um, so yeah, and the paying attention, the being, it, it doesn't mean being hyper, hyper aware all the time, it just means learning to like chill and go with the flow and, you know, be diverted down this road, down that road, into, into that bush, go down that pathway. Oh, okay, no, maybe I'll go down that pathway. Why am I going down there? I don't know. Oh, shit, there's a bird being damaged. I don't know if it's beyond help. Usually if a, if a bird is showing sickness or, or injury, it's probably too, too late to do anything, but find the bird, take the bird home. The bird dies with you. Then the, the bird was meant to die with you. There was a relationship building there and you were nurturing its death. It's learning to have these very short 
and fluid relationships with everything because then it all starts talking back to you and I think that's one of the things that hooks into what Al's doing is you know Al, Al's were, I, and I don't I know very little about what Al does and when people say geomancy to me I'm like I have no idea you know I could go away and read on it but I haven't done it so therefore I have no idea but by building a relationship with your environment and paying attention all the time in every, just being normal um, you start to get communication back which can be a form of divination and so it starts to augury. It, it starts to open up interesting doors. And what Al does and, and the people through the centuries that developed what Al does noticed this and started formulating the language because the land does have its own language regardless of what country you're in. There are certain things that are inherent. So you can talk to someone from, you know, India in the middle of India, and they'll say, oh, yeah, we've got beings that do that. Yeah, yeah, no, when we see birds, we think the same thing. That's interesting. And you start to realize that, that although we can't all speak each other's languages, the land can. And the land will keep, you know, saying, hello, hi, um, hello, yeah. hi. And eventually you figure out that the land is trying to make a connection that land could that consciousness could be from a tree a rock a bird a spring a river and everything communicates with you as soon as you get rid of the 20th and 21st century i am totally sane so therefore there is nothing talking to me you know i i am i am too scientific for that or i'm too organized or too intelligent to think about that you throw all that out the window and just go with it and start paying attention. And then if you don't get, you know, taken away and locked in a psychiatric unit, then, you know, you're probably doing OK. And uh, you can start to you can start to build on that. I love how you articulated that distinction between, I suppose, like an active attention and then a passive attentiveness. In an earlier conversation with um, uh, Isabel Stengers, she talks about this idea of being able to be surprised by what lurks, I think is her expression. It's just this, it's, it's like an awareness, but it's not an awareness that you're actively feeding. I think it also speaks to this um, stereotype of magic that a lot of people have, which is that it's the ability to manipulate the world at will, which was the one that was carried on to sort of early modern science, right? Um, whereas there's this other side to magic, which is actually the ability to listen mm -hmm. and to become yeah, a, a conversation partner. Yes, yeah. it's, it's, the, the same thing is when, when you start interacting as a magician and you're, you're interacting with nature, you're building patterns of behavior, you're, you're building energetic patterns, you're building patterns of communication and everything around you has these, their own patterns. And the type of awareness is when you are aware of the patterns, people call it fit, people call it all different sorts of things, it doesn't matter. But that when it starts to shift, you feel it, that's your passive awareness. It bumps up against you and it's not quite what you think it should be. That feels a bit weird, what's going on there? And so you follow that feeling, you follow that shift in the pattern which can be to do with the change in weather that's coming in. It can be to do with it. When I lived on the San Andreas Fault, then I got a crash course in how patterns communicate with you and how you feel it, because it's right there. And you, it's, there is no way of explaining it, um, but you feel the earthquake before, just before it happens. And it isn't that you're feeling it before it happens, is that you're picking out on the vibration before it gets strong enough to start shaking things. So again, it's a passive awareness and that builds your communication with the land. In The land is talking by starting to move and you pick up on that at a very subtle level. So you've got your warning, you know, get out the house um, or sit there and let the house fall down but have an interesting experience while you're going through that. But yeah, it, you know, it, it, you have to, 
it's very easy, especially in the more shamanic type of magic, to try and rationalize it and to try and give it names because that's what we do. We give things names and we rationalize. Um, and then you lose 50% of it. If you learn not to rationalize and not to classify and just learn to flow with things, then you start to build communications and build relationships and relationships then build nurturing and so on. Speaking of awareness, I'm aware that Alan's been waiting. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's cool. This is wonderful. Um, I, I love that point you, you, you made, Simone, about um, elements of pattern and patterns can be constellated. And I'm interested in who and what and how that, 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 constellate, that constellating happens, right? Uh, we're talking about cultivating awareness and cultivating relationships with patterns and spirits that are there. Um, and I absolutely agree, you know, uh, 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 Josephine, you know, the, the, the idea of, of, of just trying to impose our own ideas and our own categorizations and our rationalizations definitely gets in the way, it seems, of clear spirit contact, communication, and, uh, and knowing where you stand in your own presence and your own groundedness at the, you know, at the, at the crossroads of yourself, certainly. What I'm, what I'm interested in is where, hmm, as a diviner, I'm interested in the natural patterns that are there that I'm engaging with, that I'm not creating, right? That I am fostering, that are uh, hopefully with my engagement and my, you know, um, attention and, you know, me, me showing up and doing what I've said I'll do, um, that, that the, the, the relationship is emergent, the pattern of, of, of collaboration uh, or antagonism in some cases is emergent, but the patterns are already there. And so for me as a, as, as a diviner and particularly as a geomancer who is interested in the, you know, what, uh, what Sam Block calls the, the theoretical alchemy of how each of these 16 answer figures isn't just a flavor of, of element, it contains within it uh, a, a, a map of how elements are interrelating. And so I'm interested in what the, what the natural flavors of the cosmos are already doing, interacting, uh, and where divination can help us go with that flow more rather than present us with more mediation that separates us from those experiences and those engagements. So uh, again, I, I, I quite agree, Josephine, like this idea of attempting to like prove spirits uh, to someone else who's already skeptical about it anyway, uh, is, you know, seems a bit of a fool's errand, if not also trying to nail fog to a wall. Uh, that said, I think confirming with divination and even confirming with computational divination, as well as things that get called non-rational ways of knowing, trance states, altered states, ways of, of, of engaging. The best diviners, the best priests, the best magicians I know are people that do both, right? That, that will throw sticks or shells or, or, or some other system, uh, usually like a short throw system that will confirm like, did I just hear the spirit right, you know? Uh, and that's not just about, is, am I really hearing this or not? That's also about ensuring that, you know, grimoires are full of spirits, uh, not just turning up or not just being commanded or, or, or asked or cajoled to turn up to, to give you information, but also to give you understanding of that information. There are all sorts of lovely, like little rules, lawyer loopholes cooked into a lot of those things about, you know, um, don't just, you know, make sure that you teach me this in a language I can understand. Don't just turn up with a, you know, with a text out of the haunted mirror that I have no idea what it is, right? Um, and so I think about that, not just the, the you know, the, the, the imposition of some, you know, top-down model of like, I think it's the way this is because some old book says so, right? There's the, you, you know, and that's something I liked about your talk, Josephine, about the, the kind of, you know, um, DIY empiricism of like, well, what did that spirit feel like? You know, how did it, how does it, how does it function, right? And I would say that that's cooked into an early modern sense of planetary correspondence, for instance. I think it's very easy to treat correspondence as these like tablets delivered from on high and like, you know, a lot of 19th century orders kind of said that that was what it was. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's not unexpected that people would think about it like that. But, you know, these, these categories aren't there as a, as a scholasticist imposition, um, you know, they are ways of classifying effect through, through, through a lens of a thing that looks like empiricism, right? Uh, and Frank Clarkson has done great work on showing how early modern conjuration feeds into those like notions of the, you know, the emergent scientific revolution. But 
you know, uh, a, a scorpion doesn't sting because it's martial. It's martial because it stings, right? These are ways of classifying the things that things are close to, the things that will respond to other things. As, you know, as, as Uncle Heinrich Agrippa says, magic is the, amongst other things, is the agreement and disagreement of nature with itself. So, you know, if you, if you know how to, uh, how to vaguely speak a language or sing a song that the scorpion might like or, or might respond to in a way that is efficacious towards your goal, right? Mm. Um, that might include antagonizing or agitating in various ways. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in where those categories aren't distancing us, aren't separating us, aren't a matter of individual egos being like, well, I talk to God and he looked like this, uh, but are about... Uh, What's already what's already there and not having to reinvent wheels. Uh, mm. And I'm especially interested in that in terms of the elements and the planets and their um, engagement in the sublunary realms. Yeah, and I, I love that about your talk. Where you, I mean, you end by saying that magic, um, well, as we, as a pragmatics, isn't can't be an escape. And it, and what you're showing is that it sort of its own logic impedes it from being that really. If it's taken on a good day, hopefully, <laughs> yeah. But that's really interesting because I think the the problem isn't so much the the techniques and the pragmatics; it's how they're interpreted without being actually engaged in practice, right? I mean, this is the problem with, and and the reason why we wanted to to have these conversations the way we did was because when we're talking about magic, then you do really lose some of the um, the empiricism, the 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 knowledge that comes with the know how of actually doing it which changes the theoretical framework around it. And it's that shift, which um, thinking about the environment, for instance, really brings to light the need to think pragmatically about this and to have that as the basis for your, for your theory. Now, we've got uh, questions rolling in, so I, I need to get to the, the chat. Um, and we have a, a rather large one, but really exciting and um, uh, to the point really, uh, so backtracking a bit in our conversation, we have a question from Paul about a definition of consciousness. <laughs> but I think this is really important because uh, I, I suspect that there are some, uh, some interesting and astute comments behind both of your talks here. What do you mean by consciousness? So do you have a, con uh, a conception of consciousness? Me? Yes. After you, yeah. Oh, yep, uh, am I conscious? It's, yeah, it's, it's a whole other bag of worms. If you get, for instance, in science, you, you get a group of different scientists together and ask them what consciousness is, you'll have a bun fight within about 10, 15 minutes. It, it, what is it? I don't, I have no idea and I have no idea how to define it other than things talk and some things don't. And it's it's very predictable so what i found for instance and um i am not completely mad but stones don't talk but things that inhabit stones do um things that are alive will communicate and if something is communicating to me that's conscious. And if it can break through my imagination to get something through to me, that's consciousness. Um, I don't think consciousness is the complex list of, you know, can it do this? Is it aware of itself? Is it aware of um, creation? Is it, I don't know. I, I leave all that to the academics. To me, what consciousness is, if something can communicate and, it, you know, as a young magician, you, you question, is this my own mind? And this is why we're saying it's very important. Just go ahead with it. Just go for it. Because through time and practice, you do start being aware that there are things that are not you that are communicating to you. And then you open these communications. To me, that's the conscious. How it perceives itself. And how it is when it's not dressed in my imagination, I have absolutely no idea, which is why I was saying in the talk, what are these beings that we're talking to? We really don't know. We have no idea. Um, 
we give different dressings and classifications, that's for us. And that's for our imagination to work with. But if something crosses the bridge into your imagination to get a message through to you, then you're talking to a consciousness. What that consciousness is attached to and how conscious it is, I have no, I, I don't know. Sorry, it's not very, very intelligent answer, but that's as good as it's gonna get. I've been reading um, Bruce Smith's Key of Green recently. Um, it's just over there. I was almost gonna, gonna jump over and try and find the quote, but he, he's talking about consciousness pretty early on and mentions that the first use in English, seem, one of the first use in English seems to be uh, a play, I forget who, but one of the characters is discussing an awareness of her own desire and an awareness of how others perceive her desire. And there's, uh, I mean, obviously, like that, what we mean now by the word consciousness, but an, an awareness of one's own, some, some sense of being aware of what one is doing, right, is, is, is where the word comes from in English, at least when we're talking about it. Um, so not to start off with a Webster's Dictionary defines, but I, I think that's a, that's a helpful thing to talk about. It's, it's, it's a, there's a sense of awareness of uh, desire while also understanding that desire itself is rooted in perception and emerges from the, you know, the sensitive faculties of the soul uh, uh, moving towards or away from things uh, in various ways. But desire is rooted within your body. If you take, you know, if we, we in magic separate out the spirit and the body, desire comes from the body. It comes from the brain system. It comes from the digestive system. It, it's a part of a survival mechanism within the body itself. And one I think I think there may be a difference between locating the experience or the phenomenology of it in the body or through the body, but that to say that it emerges from the body as opposed to emerging from the the nexus of the porous like self and environment. Like I don't think but, that's. I don't think that's a consistent or accurate take on how early modern magicians would have been would have been doing this stuff. I mean, we're we're talking about pre Descartes, right? So we're we're talking about before, as as Bruce Smith says, you know, European intellectuals decide that we can think without our bodies. Right, and we're talking we're talking about today. We're talking about modern magic now. Um, desire is is a survival mechanism. Um, so that's not communication. Desire is itself. I, I need sex, I need food, I need a drink of water, I want to talk to God. All of those things are rooted within the physical body. Um, and that's one thing I've noticed over decades of inner work and working with beings and communicating with beings is desire is not something that tends to come through. Not when it's not your consciousness that's talking. Um, unless it's a physical type of being which wants to feed and then it does feed off of your emotion by triggering your wants and needs, and then it can feed off of that energy. But in terms of, you know, going out in the forest and things like that and, and talking to nature wherever, is I, I think we're, what we're actually dancing around is the word desire um, rather than necessity. You know, you do get a lot of beings that communicate out of necessity, but that's not the same as desire. So I think this, this is one of the things in, when we have magicians talking that are from, um, you know, different types of magic is finding uh, and bashing out a vocabulary where we're all, on, we're all thinking the same thing. Cause it's like, you might be understanding desire different or quoting desire in a different way that I'm thinking of desire. I suspect, yeah. But I think that's an interesting point around the, the kind of uh, practical agnosticism you, 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 you've, you've raised as well as like we don't, it's not, it's not necessarily even useful to try and fundamentally know like what we're talking to or what the nature of it is. Um, and I, I, I agree that on a practical level, it's more important to actually engage with what's there rather than, mm -hmm. you know, let anxiety about what this means get in the way of the actual experience you're having. I, I agree. I think it's also worth us bearing in mind that, you know, there are an awful lot of perspectives, like non-Western perspectives on what consciousness is mm. that are worth us, you know, um, 
acknowledging as you know different different stories different different sets of people feeling out different parts of the elephant yeah oh, um, and you know i think there's also a difference between like a, a, a pragmatic kind of agnosticism there and saying that it's it's unknowable right yeah yeah I'm reminded of a playful interpretation of consciousness, which thinks with the fact that it con means can mean with. So consciousness is a kind of thinking with, uh, which speaks to the idea of communication also, and also desires kind of uh, acceptability to desire. Um, now we have a really long and beautiful question from Chris, who is an artist who works very closely with a particular place, a coastal dune system that contains a series of marshes. And they think traditional astrologers would say that the dunes being dry, hot and barren belong to Mars and perhaps attribute them to the zodiacal sign of Aries. The marshes of course are very different being moist and cool and could be said to belong to the zodiacal sign of Cancer. This opens up for me a whole array of traditional symbolism with which to engage as an artist really fascinating perspective. Would a geomancer be able to use the symbolism in order to contact and perhaps communicate with non-human spirit entities in this environment? So speaking of some of the things you didn't really uh, have a chance to get into much in your talk, how might this look or work in practice? How different is this to the more shamanistic type approach such as Josephine describes? Great question. That's a, that's a wonderful question, yeah. Um, different languages, uh, right? Different, different interfaces there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, uh, absolutely that engagement with landscape being based on like those, you know, those Aristotelian manifest qualities of, of the, 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 you know, can you touch it? Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it wet? Is it dry? Those kinds of things. So they give us uh, an elemental basis and then uh, developing from there. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think um, the easiest way to frame how like a diviner or, or, or um, you know, the, the geomancy I practice like informed by like pre-modern practices and you know, talking to dead geomancers. Uh, it's uh, it's the so it's the sorcery from the sortilege, right? So most divination tools, I think, you could use for for active um, active sorcery or active courting of uh, of the spirits of those figures, right? In the same way that, or in 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 a not dissimilar way to the way that we might, you know. Um, if a, a significant tarot card falls for us in a reading, we might take that card and use it as an image of that thing as well. And at what point do the lots of fate in Sortilage uh, have the option presented to those who can now understand them to rearrange them a little bit, right? The, the, the interaction between knowledge and action is, is very interesting to me there. And I, we get a lot of, of trial records of, of diviners being accused of trying to cause the things that they're reading on. And I don't think that's entirely an ignorance about how divination and sorcery aren't necessarily so separate. So for me personally, I work with the, the forms of the figures uh, as these kind of haunted doorways um, where, co where spirits of the patterns and coherences uh, that, we're, that we're describing uh, can come, can come through. And then for me, the, um, it becomes the use of, of geomantic sigils that are based out of the, the forms of the figures themselves. And there's a couple of reasons for that. There's some semiotics to it, the, uh, you know, the, the way that we talk about the, the, the things that co are called through those figures uh, being, um, being bound or being uh, given form uh, in some way. Uh, geomantic figures, again, without pictures, it's kind of difficult to show. They're, they're points in a, in a binary system. So one or two dots, you can do them with these lovely gang sign things. So the figure of conjunctio, two, one, one, two, the, the, the devil horns on its side is a mercurial figure of the, of the crossroads amongst other things. Uh, so it's lots of X's or lots of things that look like X's or things that look like, say, you know, um, uh, hourglasses or, or whatnot that 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 fundamental shape that you're you're connecting the dots and so as such they seem to exist somewhere between uh, early modern ideas of sigils as very particular astrological uh symbols and modern ideas of sigils uh, uh austin spare of you know and i mean this absolutely respectfully diy magic squiggles right that you are making your own meaning and your own thing and you are constructing something or creating something or there's an emergence going on uh, and so for me, it's about going to the spaces that already have those coherences of spirits and uh, calling them or cohering them by the things, by like calling to like, by game recognizing game, and then working with them through those, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Go. So, 
I know nothing about geomancy, so it's pointless asking me anything. No, no, but the, the, the question was um, wanting to look at uh, how different this would be to the approach that you described. So I think the idea is that um, an artist who wants to kind of listen, I suppose, to a landscape and using these different approaches of listening. So um, Al's description of listening through figures and uh, your your d description of listening by um, learning first to recognize the patterns of these places and then becoming sort of... Uh, I mean, is it, she, she said she was an artist. Um, to me, what I would do, if, if she's working with a very particular piece of land and she's working as an artist, she's already break, she's already starting to communicate with the land by creating on the land. Um, what I would do is that I'd go out into these dunes and hang out there and draw and paint and sleep and eat my sandwiches and leave some sandwiches for the creatures and you know watch how the wind moves the sand and watch how you know how water or rocks interact with it what creatures come through that's how I would build up a relationship with it um, and then you know as for I work as a um, a ritual and visionary magician, so that's that's my form. That's how I pattern things. You know, Al Al works with you know these these different patterns and and science. That's how his mind flows through it. As an artist, you know, those are the greatest magicians because what she can do is actually give voice to the land by sitting on it, getting used mm -hmm. to it, and then letting the letting the art do itself. All that she does is provide the hands and the materials and let it speak and then build up a communication that way. But there's, there's many artists that have done that over centuries and, and particularly in the last hundred years is a series of paintings of communication with the land. Um, Monica Schu, who um, was from Sweden, she, she's dead now. She was an amazing character, an amazing magician and an artist. And that's one of the things she did. Is she, I would say, well, what are you planning to paint? She said, I don't know till I get there. And when I get there, I'll know, because then I'll start painting it. And that's what it wants to say. What's it saying? I don't know, but that's what it wanted to say. And then two years later, she'll say, oh, I know what it was saying. It was saying this, but it's a bit late now. But yeah, that's how you build up your relationships. What's interesting here is that there is, it's almost like a kind of um, complementary movements. I mean, I may be oversimplifying, but um, in geomancy, uh, using geomancy as a, as a technique of attentiveness to place, you could start with the figure and then from the figure, you find that which resonates with it. And it's sort of movement from the inside to the outside. And Josephine, when you described the method, which is more the artist one, you start from the outside and then you come in, right? These are sort of complementary movements because what you have is this image, like the, the geomantic image. Um, so you have these two Im these two symbols at the end, but they were reached in really different ways. But they're sort of complementary, and you, we're talking about techniques that can be used also complementary, like by one person. This is really fascinating. Does that make any sense? That sort of presentation? yeah, absolutely. I'm 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 yeah. Uh, 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 you know, there's um there's a big deal made of the fact that um, the 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 figures and their sigils these 16 like answer figures of the of the system um are said to be betwixt images and characters which is to say that they are both ideographic and pictographic so sometimes you can read you know conjunctio as the x that marks the spot literally the x on the contract that you can't read you know there are, there, there are a bunch of associated meanings there uh but also it's conceived of as partly just you know, in the same way we talk about nomina, uh, like barbarous names or words, like it's just, that's just the cheat code that makes the universe do a certain thing. And the, the, that we have both going on is semiotically fascinating, but also very practically useful in terms of, yes, the, the feeling of the thing and the engagement with an underlying uh, layer. Or not even underlying layer, uh, 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 a ground of possibility that is like allowing things to, and, and is in the process of unfolding and, and emerging. Yeah. A kind of virtuality, yeah. So we now have a, a question to Josephine. Are there any parallels between the everyday magical awareness that you describe and the expanding web of context that comes with an ecological awakening? 
Well, an ecological awakening, I mean, with, the, with this meaning of an ecological awakening, are you talking about the planet changing or our awareness? I'm presuming what the question is meaning is, is our awareness. Yeah. Um, yeah. The thing is, is that one relies on the other constantly. Um, if you if you have an everyday awareness, you also then start to see over time changes, damage, um, shifts in climate, how farming affects things, things like that. And we we have this huge crisis going on in so many different ways around the planet. Um, if one helps you understand the other because you start to notice it. And again, it's back to building that relationship. And that's so important in ecology. If you have an absolutely emotive relationship with the land around you, you're going to protect it more. Um, when it comes to, um, from a, an action perspective, there's lots of big things that are going on around the world through legislation, economics, through psychology, through environmental studies, things like that. And you also have to look after your own backyard. You also have to look after your own little area. And if you get to know your own little area and start to look after it, you are contributing. And the more people that do that, the more change that starts to bring, not only on an outer level, but magically at an inner level it starts to snowball, it starts to change consciousness and it starts to move outwards. It's, it's like throwing a pebble in the water magically and it starts to ripple out. This is why it's, you know, I, I do get a lot of questions from, from people who are interested in magic or are studying magic and they'll say, you know, this is such a disaster. What ritual do I do? And it's like, don't even start there. Start by looking after what's around you with intent, with magical intent to bring whatever change is necessary rather than your own imposed. Let's keep the environment as it is now. That's not what you should be doing is, is whatever is needed so that it's very fluid, so that it can shift and change. The planet is constantly changing. Um, so you work with that capacity. And from an inner perspective, what starts to happen is new patterns form. And new patterns start to connect with someone else that's doing that, probably in a couple of weeks way but it starts to form another pattern and from a magical perspective those patterns start communicating and, and changing and shifting which then starts to flow through into the consciousness of the magicians and the people so you know there's all the big stuff you can do and there's also lots of little things that from an outer perspective you know an everyday perspective help they do good stuff feed the birds, you know, look after things. From a magical perspective, doing that on the outer starts to change things on the inner. If you do it with intent, with focused intent, and you pay attention, you start to, it doesn't take the magical rituals, it takes everyday things. And then they all start to connect up. And so, you know, people like Al that are doing his thing, he's, if he does it with intent, um, and he's getting into a conversation through his forms of divination, with the land where he is, that starts to form a pattern as well. And these patterns do start talking to each other, start interconnecting. You start to bring in a change. And then eventually you start to see it in the consciousness of the people. It starts to shift. It's a bit like social engineering, but using magic slowly. I, I think that's a, that's a, uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm, I'm thinking right on here, this is something that struck me in, in, in listening to your, your talk, Josephine, about um, imagination. And, and, and it struck me that uh, that's the, that's the extra piece, right? We're not just talking about like an individual kind of connection. We're talking about how that affects everyone, and certainly this this older idea of the imagination, not just as a image making faculty in our own, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a glorious portal in our own skulls, but is but has like this field like quality. Right? This is the same concept that uh, you know uh, pre modern doctors would talk about. You know, the difficulty of people catching other people's nightmares, Ooh. and that we are capable of. You know that 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 the consciousness is not localized within like the boundaries of this 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 bone dome, right? Uh, and that that part is interesting to me, right? Where how do we think ecologically, not just in terms of like our individual relationship to nature and the outside, but like to each other and 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 the and those ideas around 
humans being in some sense natural and emerging from nature. You know, that, that Alan Watts thing about the planet peoples, like the apple tree apples. This is a, a verb that's going on. I'm interested in those notions where, again, where we are connected. We don't, we don't happen to the earth. We, we, you know, we're part of it coming out of it. Um, and I, I find that with, you know, natural astrology charting, not just uh, places of, 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 of natural beauty, like, you know, but also places where humans have affected the environment and that a battlefield is martial, uh, but it's no less natural in terms of this natural magic than an ant heap is saturnine, right? It's a thing that animals do in the world. That doesn't mean that everything we do is fine. Uh, I want to be very careful about that, but I want to, yeah, that, 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 that's interesting to me, conceiving how humans emerge from their environment and affect each other as well. You know, yeah. the, the, the imagination is shared to an extent, that yeah. field. Yeah, and also this, this thing with, there's too much Disney realm that, that can get into both magic and ecology. And, you know, one of the things that, that nature is, is creative and destructive. Um, you know, it, it's, it isn't Disney, it's tooth and claw, and it's constantly changing, and it's constantly creating, and it's constantly breaking down and destroying. And finding that center for magicians to let both sides flow through and understand that everything in nature is destructive as well as creative. And like you say, Al, you know, we've, you have to be careful with the language because someone will go, oh, it's okay, then I can destroy as much as I like. Yeah, no, that's not the point, is seeing the balance and learning to work with that balance. Yeah, and one of the things that have come up, um, has come up a lot, especially in the Witch Bodies panel, is the, the way in which um, magic finds it necessary to kick back against this strong nature culture division, right? Because necessarily, if magic is attention, of course, if we don't accept that, then we have a problem. But if it is attentiveness, it's attentiveness to everything. Really. Um, and to, to make that distinction between what deserves our attention and what doesn't creates lots of problems. Um, because of course, if we can't show like the plastic spoon attentiveness, then we won't understand then, then that's why we have rubbish dumps, right? Instead of having a kind of uh, a better way of, of reusing an object. Um, so we have it, we're lots of new questions uh, falling in. Now, there was one that was more of a comment that spoke to something quite interesting though, which is that stones do not talk, Beatrice. Um, that says a, about an earlier comment that was really made about, um, it's the being that inhabits the stone that, that communicates, not the stone itself. Uh, which I thought was really interesting. And I know if you'd like to say something more about how you have found, because you said that you've found from experience that stones don't speak, but it's a sort of being that inhabits the stone. And I suppose how that would speak to what has floated about in some of our earlier conversations, which is, you know, animism. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just in terms of communicating. Um, I personally, and this is one of the problems with magic, is it has to come from your own personal experience. And, you know, how somebody else will maybe have a completely different experience. Um, what I found personally is when I get an actual direct communication, it often tends to be a being within the stone, not the stone itself. However, one of the things that I spent a lot of time doing in my late 30s was, was working in caves and with mountains and with um, fault lines um, is sinking into film in, in vision is, is working and just taking myself down and then going down and down and down into the stone. And what I expected when I was doing that work was it to be like going into a very cold room um, or, or a very dense space. And I spent a lot of my teenage years underground as a, as a caver. So I know what it feels like to be in an enclosed space. It didn't feel like that. What it felt like was that I was in something that was aware that I was there and I was aware of it, but there was never any communication. Now, I could then say, well, I, a stone has never communicated to me, but then you think of the age of stone, how old stone is, what its time cycle is. And then you think of the time cycle of a human, you know, where, when like a nanosecond to stone. So it could be that stone is consciousness, that it has consciousness, but I'm moving too quickly to be aware of that. 
Yeah, that's fascinating. You know, the, the, the way in which non-humans will communicate, but we not, may not be able to, to actually perceive the communication. Well, I found that with trees, you know, and, and especially working in the Pacific Northwest in the US it, with the very big um, trees with the redwoods there is their time, you know, was so long compared to mine. And it's like, for instance, I was in this, this area near Santa Cruz many years ago. And I was in this small grove and I was just sort of hanging out and eating a sandwich. And I, I got this communication of get out, danger, get out, you know, so we're all going to die, get out. And so I panicked and left. And an earthquake, that was the epicenter of an earthquake, but two weeks later. But that two weeks later was that second to that grove. And that was the first time I was in my, I don't know, early 30s, that it ever occurred to me that things in nature have different time lengths. Different time scales, right? We're, we're back to uh, consciousness and octopuses or aliens or like, you know, others and that, and that notion of how do we, how do we know that it's gonna look like what we expect it to look like? How do we, and, and crucially, how do we afford, um, you know, uh, a reasonably wide field to be surprised? How do we, you know, uh, how do we leave room to be amazed by what, how weird spirits might be? Mm -hmm. And for me, uh, Redwoods, especially like that, 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 um, that glimpse of deep time of mm -hmm. like, you walk into that clearing and it's clear because a tree that big used to be there and now isn't. So it took that long to grow and then that long to, uh, yeah, love, love, love Redwoods. But for me, the, 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 the point around I might not be able to communicate with the mountain. And I've had similar experiences where I can get a sense that I am, you know, glim I'm, 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 I'm glimpsing something vast and cyclopean, <laughs> not to get too Lovecraftian, uh, but the, 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 the communication can't work. So finding translators, finding intermediary spirits, mm. building yeah. networks of interrelationality, these grapevines, same with ancestor work, right? Mm. Like I can't speak old English as well as I would like to. Uh, but I have a couple ancestors in between me and them mm -hmm. that are able to telephone game back and forth down the dinner table, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So building, and, and again, that's that's a way of like learning how like the other thinks, the space for, for, for that, and also building collaborations between intermediaries yeah. and, and out these as translation issues. Yes, mm -hmm. I mean, that's how the, that's how the Egyptians worked, uh, particularly mm -hmm. is their deity were... That wasn't a god, and that wasn't the goddesses and things like that. That was an intermediary with the force of nature. Right. You know, and in the same way, trees are going to require certain fungi to even be able to interact with their land as well, right? That, that those intermediaries are literally ensuring that nutrients can be passed back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. There's a yeah. fascinating yeah. Um, Look like how nature is itself. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry, no, no, I just. I was, I, I was reminded of a really interesting uh, text that the pianist and composer Olivier Messiaen wrote. It's called A Treatise on Ornithology, I think. And he thinks about the timescales of different beings, different creatures, different non-human creatures, especially fascinated by birds. And he translates this, the problem of, of, of scalability, he translates it into music. And so um, he takes the, the sort of the rhythm of birdsong and he slows it down so it's um, comprehensible to a human ear and he uses music as a mode of translation. Sort of music and magic can also have connections, don't they? Um, so I'm now going to bring put together two questions. I hope that's all right, but I thought they were interrelated and we have so many coming in. Uh, first question talks about how we distinguish between daily magical awareness and religious awareness, which I thought spoke to something that, um, Al, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, which is that when doing geomancy, you were supposed to be in a sort of prayerful mindset, right? Which seems to suggest that there is this fluidity between religious and magical awareness. Um, and then the second one was um, asking about what were some of the elements and practices that mediate our communication with non-humans or mediate the invitation, things like listening, meditation, or psychedelics. Um, so I thought there was just an interesting connection between those two questions. Is there this fluidity between religious and magical awareness? Maybe the distinction is not particularly helpful. And then what are some of the, the tech that we can use to, to um, 
facilitate that awareness and, and listening? Um, in terms of religion and magic, to me, they're very separate things. Um, religion is heavily tied up with culture, um, with um, different different genetic lines, different tribes. It, 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 it comes out of the land, a religion comes out of the people in the land. And they, they, it's made by men as a way of talking to what's around them, a way of talking to God or to God. And it, it plays to what humans think are the desires of the gods. So they, well, I really like this, so I'm gonna give it to you. There's, there's, there's all, and you're bigger than me, so I'm gonna be really nice to you and butter you up. Um, whereas magic, for me anyway, and, and the stream that I work in is, is a lot more pragmatic and, and a lot more based around necessity. So I wouldn't pray before I did something, but I would still myself and become very quiet um, so that I'm tuned and then ready to work. So it, it's, but there is many streams of magic that do cross over into religion. And um, I work with various different religions for their patterns as, as a form of tapping into things and communicating with things um and, and as a way of understanding but um I, I think you have to be slightly careful you know deciding is what you're doing religious or is what you're doing magical because when you start to cross those over it starts to get tricky from a magical perspective um it, it's it can cause all sorts of problems so i, I think you can Think very carefully why you're doing something. I think anything in magic is why. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to achieve? And is this for you to make you feel better? Or is this actually for something outside of you? And if it's for you to make you feel better and get you to, then that's fine. Um, but often when you're trying to connect with spirits, being prayed at is the last thing that they tend to want. They're just like, yeah, 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 get, get. what? What do you want? What do you need? why or oh, i'm trying to tell you shut up i'm trying to tell you something you know so that's that's my take on that i don't know what al thinks i think it's um really important that we bear in mind something that you raised in your, in your talk josephine about how even if we aren't and, and maybe especially when we aren't uh we as you know um uh, westerners for want of a better term even when we aren't consciously identifying as Christian. We, are, we have been Christianized. Our culture is, has that, that over layer on it and we need to be very careful about examining that. I think that's especially true when we talk about what we mean by different religious and magical contexts. Um, you know, the certainly, you know, the, 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 the outsider looking in view is that religions are man-made, but the, the emic view from, from priests of those religions is that those religions were revealed or were transmitted or were given by the gods to people. So there's a, there's a distinction here. And obviously like user error is always gonna be, gonna be a factor, but I think that's worth bearing in mind, especially when, you know, in, in my experience uh, of, of being involved in uh, Afro-diasporic uh, religious and spiritual practices and sorcerous practices is that the distinction is very much like what priests do versus what sorcerers or magicians do like it's it's there's a kind of a labeling theory thing we're all working from the same cosmos but one of them is is through some gods and one of them is is doing something a little bit different one of those agreed is worship and knowing which you're doing i agree josephine is absolutely crucial um uh, yeah but i think again the difference between what are you engaging with and how is that shifting your ability and awareness to do a thing doesn't necessarily mean that you are if you're using religion or, or meditation or a spiritual practice to do magic right to 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 as you say like find your center again if i'm not putting words in your mouth uh you know that you can go to gods your gods and pray and like ask for the clarity strength wisdom happiness health etc and then go and do some magic uh, and and it's linked in your life but that doesn't mean that you are shoving that thing into that thing you're doing you know it's a way of drawing strength from different sources yeah yeah and I think as, as in terms of tech to facilitate communication, um, oh God, magic, Western magic alone has huge amounts of, of different tech, so to speak. Um, 
basically, for once you're into communicating with beings, you're you're needing to use the imagination. Because that's that's the filter. It's like you know, if you're going to look at art, you need eyeballs. It's pretty simple. Um, so you the, the imagination is the translator um, and dresses things so that you can recognize and also form a bond with something. So to use the imagination, you need to use the mind. To use the mind, first you need to be able to shut out and sit down and be quiet. And then when you can sit down and be quiet, then sit down and listen. Um, and then learn to be still and move around while holding that stillness and listening without it being an effort. Hence, so much in Western magic uh, throughout history started with very basics of meditation um, and learning stillness. And, and the idea of using the mind as a major tech in magic, even within ritual, you're, you should be using your mind goes right back to the Greek philosophers. It's, you know, you look at Plotinus, you look at all of these, they're full of very subtle hints of, yes, but you need to use your mind. The mind is the most important. And we, when we're reading those texts, we think, oh, I have to be intelligent. That's not what it's saying, is your mind, your vision, your dreams, your imagination. Forming that, that is your text. And each different type of magic has different ways of approaching that, of training it. But it's not something that you can just sort of print off the internet and boom, you've got it. Like everything that's real, it, it, you have to work at it and develop it. And the other one actually, which is a very good form of communicating with beings if you're really not gonna be able to work through the imagination. And it's something that Al talked about is divination. Um, and, you know, going back to what I was talking about a while ago, when I'm out in nature and I pick up something in a pattern, one of the things that I do is uh, work with the deck. If, if I'm picking up something serious, I need to know exactly what it is, why it is, where it's going, who it is. And I use the deck and I use my own layouts to do that. And, and I design my own decks for specific things so that I get a good vocabulary because the, you know, with, with my own decks, I just use words. That's my vocabulary that I can build from to get specific communication. So it's no good for doing a reading to find out if my Auntie Betty is going to be pregnant for the eighth time, but it will tell me if there's something damaging coming that I can intervene in, in some way. So what is that intervention? Use a different layout, get that down. And you can use that same method for talking with beings. It's a vocabulary, basically. It's just a translator. Um, and so, you, you know, with divin uh, divination is the other very strong leg in magic. Imagination and divination are the two forms of communication um, to go forward to, to build relationships with beings and to get, to get communication going properly. Well, on that theme of language, we have a question that touches on something we mentioned earlier, which is to what extent is this nature culture, the human nature dichotomy, all these dichotomies that we've been talking about, maybe also the magic religion one, is it a result um, of the limited vocabulary of Western languages? Meanwhile, many ancient and indigenous languages being frequently more verb than noun based, ascribe a more equal and reverent regard toward more than human living worlds and thus allow for a more open two way mode of communication. I wonder what is the importance of the language and vocabulary you use and work with in your practice? And yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting to hear about whether you've learned um, thinking with other languages and yeah. It, it is important. Um, and I never realized how important language is to how it forms, how you think, and how you output. Um, until I got into conversations with magicians around the world from completely different cultures and, and using different language and realizing that even though you can translate certain things, it doesn't have the same meaning at a very deep level. It can get, concepts can be almost impossible to switch between certain cultures because the vocabulary isn't there. And the verb, the, the, the you know, form of language that uses more verbs than nouns is, is a really useful language. And, um, you know, I spent a lot of time looking at the um, funerary text 
from um, particularly from the, the New Kingdom, the early New Kingdom and the Middle Kingdom. And uh, Middle Egyptian is, is very pragmatic. It's very interesting. It's very layered. It has all these different layers to it. And it's very doing. It's all very doing words. And um, the titles of spirits are, are what they do. They're not given abstract names, which started to come in by the time you're getting into, you know, Ptolemaic and, and, and then you're lapping into early Christianity and everything. Everything had abstract names that had names that, that didn't really mean much. Um, practicality, that is the way to go. If you, if you want to talk to beings, these practicalities and English in particular is not very practical. Not, not really, you know, it, it, just just in the conversations we're having, it, it, it's far more abstract and it's, you know, it, someone, the, the question that was asked was saying in a, in a tribal society, it, it, the language structure is different. It's, it's very verbs. Um, and for a while I, I lived um, on a reservation and worked for a tribe. Um, and one of the things I found there, even though everyone was talking English and Salish, is that when they were talking English, is they're still thinking in Salish terms, which I found fascinating. And it took me a while to sort of switch gears for communications. Um, but it's so much fucking easier, sorry. It's so much easier when you've got a practical vocabulary going with people and it isn't all this abstract. It isn't all this academic talk. It's just really down to action, doing, function, necessity, which then changes how you think, which changes how your magic works. The whole thing becomes less cumbersome and a lot more fluid and a lot more pragmatic. And then it starts to work things out. I don't know what Al, how Al thinks. I, I'm coming around to the opinion that I think most magicians should try and learn another language, even if it isn't, you know, even if you're not interested in, I don't know, 19th century French diabolists, like learn French, like, like don't do it to raid someone else's like temples, but do it to like affect yourself and to understand that like, uh, and get used to like not knowing how to communicate again. That's really like, I'm in the process of learning several languages for the the traditions I'm, I'm, I'm part of, uh, and I, I'm not good at it, like, uh, but like I'm, I'm trying to turn up and bang my head against it. And A, there's a sense of getting better at things I'm not good at, you know, that's, 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 that's why I'm, I'm turning up to try and, to try and do this work. Um, but also just getting used to not expecting everything to be on your terms. Yeah. And especially, let's be clear, in like the Anglosphere and the way that, you know, an awful lot of our friends in various post-colonial departments and things throughout the the academy and and and, and certainly outside of it are, are very interested in how um, a, a dominance of the English language is is is, is not helpful uh, mm -hmm. in terms of not just these different ways of being, but these 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 complex articulations of things that we you know that we risk losing uh, mm -hmm. when when languages aren't shared and passed on and whispered into the you know ears of children and things. So I, I, I think it's really crucial. I think I think magic is about engaging with the with the other, and and working out you know that we're weirder than we thought we were, and that the world is weirder than we thought it was, uh, and and I think yeah, language and and specifically for me, I've been trying to appreciate. Um, I remember this feeling and use it in my acting. Um, the feeling of like not being able to communicate clearly in a language with a room full of elders, and like what that is, and how that like moves me to to, to try and improve and do better. Um, I think there's, there's a hell of a lot of egotism that comes with, you know, you, you, you've got to have an ego about you to think that you can talk to like angels or, or things to a certain extent. And as such, we need to be very careful about how we um, don't feed our pomp. I, I need to be very careful about how I don't feed my pomposity. Uh, and so putting myself in position, learning how to be, to be used to knowing what to do when you don't know what to do. Uh, and so for me, that's, that's, that's that, that vital wit divination is a part of that um uh, uh, developing spirit contact is part of that developing consistent relationships and and you know being what you turn up to do yeah over and over again yeah yeah and and um language wise you know if you're having to learn a lot of languages is if if you're in the community with one of those languages 
get a Wilkerson club in one of the places that doesn't speak English, one of the backstreet cafes. Right, imagine, yeah. Kids will learn really fast in, in the worst possible way, but it's exactly what you said is, is, you know, feeling what it feels like to not know what the hell anyone is talking about and, and having to learn quickly. Good magic. And it also speaks to, it also speaks to what you have both been talking about, which is especially just being this um, kind of resistance that uh, we have when, or resistance to simply listening, right? Because this is this is the challenge. You go into a room where you don't quite know the language, you know a bit. You can sort of you have a uh, one has a natural arrogance to assume communicability or the sort of superiority of one's own language, uh, and faced with something you don't understand, you don't want, really want to listen. It's it's that kind of tension which is the same thing that's going on when you walk into a forest. Like the, you know there is some kind of message coming across to you and you, you assume a sort of uh, a superiority of, of your modes of communication. That's really interesting, those parallels between those situations. Um, I, we have now a, a few questions uh, and I think I'll just do two, these two next two together again, um, as I did with the previous ones. I hope that's all right. The first one is about uh, speaking of ways of engaging with feelings of fear and with the entities and dynamics which we may feel to be frightening, ugly, uncanny, threatening, monstrous, or simply beyond our understanding. Again, speaking to this idea of why it is that we um, don't engage as readily as we should with the world around us. Um, is this related to our deep vulnerability and our fear of those aspects of existence which we um, uh, which we are afraid of, experience as destructive and dangerous, or just as unknown, unpredictable, uncontrollable. Um, so yeah, thoughts on that. Uh, ideally, ways that allow us to maintain our own integrity and safety to some degree while acknowledging and integrating uh, those shadowed aspects of our experience. So I suppose like what's, what's the risk here and, and how much do we put ourselves uh, on the line? And then the next question is um, about relating magic to technologically created space. I thought these went together because there's an aspect of, of fear in this also in vulnerability uh, online and in uh, a media which uh, in many ways like depersonalizes um, the voice. Uh, can existing magical practices be used in technological spaces? Uh, and is this relevant in this space uh, or will it need to evolve? Um, perhaps in relation to artificial intelligence uh, and so on. Does it mean that artificial intelligence are going to bring mythology and religion into any space we can explore or create? So yeah, questions of fear and to what extent uh, do we have to put ourselves on the line? Uh, and is there a way of keeping us safe? And then also in relation to technology and what that, um, what that does, can it help? Can it, is it simply bad? Um, in terms of technology, I'm probably the worst person to ask because I'm, you know, still in the 20th century. I not quite dragged myself into the 21st century. I still don't know how to use a smartphone properly. So, you know, and my my internet use is, is limited in that I, I just do certain things on the internet and then that's it. So there's a whole world out there that I just do not understand how it operates. So... You know, I am probably the worst. Person. I wouldn't touch it magically with a barge pole, put it that way. After what I've seen with social media and all this type of thing, I just, bleh. it's like putting your fingers in the toilet. Would not go there, but that's because I'm old fashioned and cranky. So not my thing. You probably get a lot more common sense out of Al than me. Um, I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, what this makes me think of is, is I, I don't want to, I don't want to not address um, the, the, the issues around vulnerability uh, yeah. in terms of like opening up and how, you know, uh, how we feel about the unknown. But I want to emphasize that I don't think this disconnect is just like a personal atomized anomic issue. Or if it is, it's because there are, there are, there are, there are way more factors. Like magical disconnect in the world is a political issue 
with personal solutions, I think, and interpersonal solutions. Like to say we're disconnected because the vastness of the cosmos or the weirdness of the cosmos scares us is, is true, but it's not the only factor here. Like the, the disenchantment of the world, like, you know, you don't have a better relationship with the forest because many of us weren't taught like in any sense how to have a relationship with that forest and had to like cobble it together ourselves. So I wanna, I, I don't know if I'm completely missing, missing the point of that question there, but I think it's, that's worth bearing in mind, like the, the process of how magic is phased out over the course of the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, like are things that we're still, you know, it's too soon to say, right? Uh, with, you know, we're working out the, 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 the influences of those, but it's it, to locate it as, as solely a, you know, individual problem, I think um, fractures it and, and, and um, doesn't allow for us to look at how we can work together to, to deepen those relationships. Um. I, I think in terms of um, fear and um, fear of being damaged or, or, you know, big scary monster eats my head, um, in terms of talking to things, if you, I mean, most people, when, when they first start doing things magically, in magic, um, don't get very far it's like a toddler it's like you know you've put the safety gate on and they can run around and bang themselves and this but actually they're okay they're not going to get out onto the main road um sometimes you get people who are natural natural magicians and they can connect with things in their consciousness and they do see and they're not nuts and they do see and communicate with a lot of things um, and it terrifies the shit out of them sometimes and i can totally understand that um, in which case, what you have to do is back it up, basically, is you want to start communicating with things, you want to start making connections with things, and it, you're fearful of it, um, it's baby steps. You know, you, 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 you don't need to be connecting with everything and having communications and, and, and conversations with everything around you until you're comfortable with it in your own time. And then you start to connect. And, that's what I'm doing with the internet, basically. It scares the shit out of me. A, because I don't know what I'm doing. And B, energetically, everything there, everything that's in human consciousness is in that pattern, an electric pattern of communication. So from a magical perspective, it's like sticking your head in a sewer. And I've not found a way to do it in a healthy way. So I tend to not stick my head in that sewer so to speak, but I, there are magicians that I do know who do very interesting things with the internet and, and not, not silly, oh, I'm doing all these sigils and I'm going to crash everything, but are actually working with the consciousness of the internet, of networks, of computers. That fascinates me. Um, and I'm still in, in baby phases with a lot of things like that because I tend to blow up computers, so I'm not very... I'm not a good case for that. But there are younger magicians who are stretching their consciousness out into technology. Um, AI, that would be a very interesting thing is to expand the consciousness, human consciousness into the pattern of AI and see if there is a pattern there that, that connects. I don't know. And it does terrify me too. Um, basic rule of thumb though, if it terrifies you, don't do it. We've got one from Gwendolyn who asks, when we start engaging in such a way to create new patterns, we're transforming ourselves, as Josephine says, and we're also changing the things around us. An example of this might be helping an injured animal recover. A communication goes on which can change things. Where is this change leading us? Again, with geomancy, to be given guidance on changes we can affect. Are these activities aimed at living in line with truth which might then align our lives to fate. Well, in any conversation, where is it taking you? I, this is one of the things that happen, I think we have to be very careful of in, in magic is dragging the 19th century mindset with us in, you know, I'm starting a conversation, where is it taking me? Where is it taking magic? Where is it taking us as a species? Who knows? You know, it, this conversation we're having tonight, where is this taking us? We have no idea, unless you sit down and do divination and find out what's coming out of it. 
um, I, I think that you can you can end up trying to control without actually realizing that you're trying to control something and that you're trying to control all communication, all expression, all magic, which you can't do. So I think what I would say to that is sit back and think about why did you ask that question? Where did that question come from in terms of magical practice? Um, it's again, learning to be pragmatic and go with the flow rather than having to have a set series of goals and jumps that you're gonna jump over. Um, let, let these conversations and these interacting patterns go where they need to go, which again is very tribal necessity. Where does the river go? Where it needs. It doesn't book an appointment. Thank you. I, I think again, it's worth us thinking about when we're talking about creating new patterns. And it sounds like what we're actually saying is creating new engagements with patterns. And I, I want to be clear about that distinction because I don't think I'm going out when I visit a river and I do work with the figure of, of via the moon's like dynamism and, 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 and changeability. I'm not creating that pattern. I am, I am I, the, the first time I do it, I'm, I'm creating an engagement. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that an emergent friendship emerges, but that pattern's already there. And so for me, there's a sense of infinity and a grain of sand about this, where it's going. And, and I, I, th I think that's an alignment with a natural truth, at least, or, or a set of natural truths, hopefully, is that you're, you know, that that's a way of engaging with that mystery of, of, of water, of, of, of rivers, of, of, uh, of rejuvenation, of, of change, of, of, of uh, you know, various ways that the moon helps understand rivers and rivers help us understand the moon and its and its energies and spirits. And so, again, like if you're working with, if you're looking for the things that are already there and like helping awaken and upregulate and downregulate certain parts, then the alignment is 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 in the course of exploring understanding the patterns of nature. Like, uh, so yeah, I, I, I think yes. <laughs> like I, 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 in brief, yeah. yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. I think we have time for one one last question. If you like that. This is a, an interesting one. Uh, have you experienced having to work on land that had no trace of a connection? I'm thinking of or, or forgotten people who were in communication with the environment being all gone. In short, no visible traditions to go back. If you have such experience, the intermediaries that you were talking about just now, do they still manage to reach out? I suppose this is relating to what um, Ali was saying. But I'm trying to get at, was there a time when there was a dead end, no ways to communicate? So this is particularly thinking, I assume, with um, the spirits of past humans, rather than trying to communicate directly with the land. I didn't get the first part of that question because your microphone faded out. No, I'm sorry. This is a question about experiencing having to work on land that had no traceable connection with people. I. I I'm not quite sure what they're meaning by that. Because again, you faded out again. Uh, a patch of land that has no people or no past of people? Yeah, I think that the question is about, I, I, I think it was picking up on something that I was talking about with um, intermediaries between uh, myself and an ancestor who lived. Okay. Right, 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 yeah. Um, for me, um, one of the places when I when I um, lived in the States, I lived in West Montana out in, in the wilderness and the tribe had only been there for about 100 years and, and not a big tribe. And before that, the, the tribes, different tribes used to come in because there's three, it was a confederacy. Um, various tribes used to come into that valley, do certain things and then leave. They, they never lived there. Um, in just before they were marched onto the reservation, they did do some burials there, but most of the burials there are, are pretty new as well. There is nothing old, dead, person-wise on that land, um, which I found really interesting working with magically. It was completely different because I was used to being in places where there were dead people uh, and generations of dead people. So being on a patch of land where there was no dead people was really, really interesting. And it was completely mm -hmm. feral. 
Um, so there was no, there was beings there and my imagination could construct intermediaries, but they couldn't, which was an interesting situation. So there was communication. It was just like somebody shouting at me in Korean and I don't understand Korean. So they shout louder just to make sure that I get it, even though I still don't understand Korean. There was, there was a lot of that and how the communication got going eventually was by action. I think they're saying this, so I go do that. Is that what they meant? No, I get a kickback. Okay, let's try that one again. Um, but I, there's no way, if you're, if you're talking about trying to reach very distant ancestors where there's no intermediaries. Um, the way I would do that, which, which that sort of thing I've done is using visionary technique over a period of time and going through a period of steps and stretching, 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 stretching. Um, for me, energetically, I found that um, exhausting and it made me sick, but I did manage to get there. Um, that is that, and with divination, I found that I couldn't do that with very distant ancestors without an intermediary, um, because there wasn't enough vocabulary. Um, but, it I mean, again, if you're going to do that, you need the visionary techniques to be able to do it, or the natural ability that you then exercised, so that you can hold, you know, an hour and a half session of communicating with something using your mind. That's how I would do it. Or just get really drunk. And it, the communication might not happen, but it, it sounds really good at the time. You never know. There are people that do that. I think if I'm, again, if I'm understanding this right, um, I've experienced, I wouldn't say dead ends in terms of not seeing I mean, yes, not seeing options, but the, uh, again, the reframing from, you know, if I go and like hold a particular attention or say particular words, it's a cheat code that the universe now has to do something back. Moving away from that model and towards a model of like, this is a conversation. I've, I've, I've been in plenty of places where, you know, it didn't want to talk to me. It didn't want to talk to anyone, you know, and that's not about an inability. That's it's, go away. We don't yeah. want you here this mountain is sacred one of the ways it's sacred is we don't walk on it like that that kind of stuff so dead end wise if, if that's what we're talking about yes that we should hold out the possibility that you know just because you, you talk to the plant I, i'm trying to build a relationship with it well that's great maybe the plant you know uh, uh, has other priorities right now you know it's just not that into you right that's that's also a, a thing we need to to hold out that if there's agency on both sides there's agency on both sides and therefore you know um that, that, that sometimes not everyone wants to talk to you, nor indeed, you know, and it's, it's a pretty entitled approach to, to expect everything to respond to you because you're talking to it or because, you know, you've, you've done the right things, whatever those might be. In terms of um, working on land um, where the people that worked it aren't there anymore, I mean, that's, that's, that's far wider issues around like, you know, um, gosh, uh, I mean, attempting to build relationships with, you know, not all intermediaries are human as well, and, and, and many traditions have ideas around intermediaries that might be totally human, that might be, you know, John Skull, the first person buried in a graveyard, right, who then becomes the, the, the doorman, so to speak, um, as distinct from like the lord and lady of the, of the cemetery, uh, to, you know, uh, traditions where like because, you know, lightning struck that tree at that time and, you know, uh, a, a fox was going past at the time and someone was stabbed to death there, like all of those things cohere into the sense of a haunting that's the spirit of that place that's that's emergent from it and the things that are going on, um, but aren't themselves uh, uh, just strictly like a person or not a person. So again, like how humans and the intermediaries relate isn't just about dead people or you know inhuman nature spirit like there's there's there's, there's interaction in even as far as as you say josephine like the difference between are there you know do you have family in the ground right are they are they are they, are they, are they doing that kind of interaction with the earth and its spirits yeah and and what you said is really really important about the arrogance you know not everything does want to talk to you and many things will tell you to go away in nice polite language of not 
Um, but yeah, that is a real big problem in, in Western magic is, is arrogance and, and expectations um, of the, I will do this recipe and this will happen. Um, and you bring that to communication with something that's outside of you, then you're gonna start getting problems. Uh, problems to be solved. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for this conversation. I'm afraid we'll have to cut it short there. We could go on um, forever. We have so many questions in the chat. The chat will be saved, and I'll send this to both of you to be able to see and if you want to interact further with the questions. I'm uh, sorry we can't answer them, but yeah, there's too, too lively an audience. Um, yeah, so finally, I just want to, to thank you both. And thank you all the audience for your wonderful questions. And thank you for tuning in. And I really look forward to seeing you again soon. And thank you again, Al and Josephine. And thank you.